on this most treacherous night. Uh, I really appreciate all of you coming and uh, being here uh, to listen to this presentation. I put a lot of research and work into it this semester, as have all of these wonderful students behind me um, who have put in uh, hours of work and have just been wonderfully supportive over this past semester. And so thank you so much for being here and sharing that with us tonight. Since being back in school, I've learned a great deal, but the single greatest thing I've learned is that I am getting old. <laughs> I am constantly learning new lingo from all of the young people in my life. For instance, just recently, I learned that if a song is peppy and memorable, the kids like to call it a bop. <laughs> As in, hey, that's a real bop. I started to think, what makes a bop? You know, why, why do some songs stick with us? Are there some tunes that are more likely to be used for years and years to come? And I think there's some truth in that. I posit that contemporary composers have employed the tunes and harmonizations of the American shape note tradition broadly over the last 50 years as source material for very creative choral arrangements. The shape note style lends parameters to this creativity, in part because the harmonized hymns disregard some of the established rules of composition. Composers are therefore free to express their own musical idiom. These tunes and their original hymn settings give composers scope for their imagination. To give a little bit of context, I'd like to share briefly about the history of the shape note tradition. Shape note singing developed in America and is therefore seen as a uniquely American folk style. However, it has roots in Great Britain. Some musicians were unhappy with the old way of singing that was occurring in many churches, particularly in the more rural areas. Congregational singing would be led through a process called lining out. A leader would sing or chant the first line, and then the congregation would respond back with that same line. There was no harmony, just a single melody. I'm going to give you a little bit of an example of that tonight, if you will bear with me and participate with me, okay? You're going to have to put on your singing hats. So, I'm going to line out a hymn for you. Thank you, putting on the hat, good. <laughs> I'm going to line out a hymn for you. I'm going to sing a line, and then I would like you to sing it back to me, okay? It's going to be pretty simple. <coughs> Amazing grace, how sweet the intact. 
male form. So in England, John Clayford, amongst others, desired to improve congregational singing by encouraging a better educated congregation who could lead their congregation in singing homophonically. Several of Clayford's con concepts influenced the development of the shape note tradition in America. He encouraged part singing of the psalms as well as the reading of musical notation, rather than relying purely on oral tradition to learn music. He also pioneered the printing of tunes in such a way that their corresponding fossil lost syllables could be recognized by sight. Now, syllable scale singing has been around since the medieval times, when Guido Lorenzo invented his seven-syllable system, which eventually became the Italian solfege syllables used most in Western music education. In 1597, Thomas Morley, a composer and organist, established a four-syllable scale system in England. He took Guido syllables, ut, re, mi, fa, sol, la, and si, and reduced them just to four syllables, fa, sol, la, and mi. So it would sound a little bit like fa, sol, la, fa, sol, la, mi, fa, with a repetition of the fa, sol, la syllables. This four-syllable singing was brought to New England by English settlers of the New World. Drawing from Playford's experiments in publishing in 1698, the Massachusetts Bay Colony published the Bay Songbook with the letters of the sol fa syllables directly underneath the notes on the staff. In 1721, John Tufts published an introduction to the singing of psalms, which emphasized the learning of tunes by note instead of by rote. Interestingly, his notes were not actual European note heads, but instead the initial letters of fa, sol, la, and mi placed on the five lines of the staff. If you look at the handout that you, should, you would have received at the beginning, you can see he's the first example of the musical notation. And you can just see the letters of each of those, the F, S, M, uh, and Ls on, on what would be uh, the staff. In 1801, William Little and William Smith made a system of four-shape notation based on Morley's four syllables. It was used as an educational device to teach sight reading. They published this new teaching method as a tune book called the Easy Instructor. Smith and Little gave each of the four syllables a corresponding shape. Fa would be a triangle, sol an oval, la a square, and mi a diamond. I recently went to a shape note singing in Columbus, Ohio, not too long ago. Uh, it's an amazing tradition, and they're very welcoming, especially of newcomers. And they like to share their, their experiences and teach you how to get in on the singing immediately. And so this is how they explained it to me, how you could remember which syllable went with which, which, went with which shape. The fa is a triangle in the shape of a flag. So you have fa for flag. The soul has an O in it, which is an awful lot like an oval. The la, if you take two L's and put them together, it's very close to a square. <laughs> we might be stretching it on that one. And then the me is a diamond, and I deserve diamonds. <laughs> so he would take these syllables and, and these corresponding shapes, he would take the shapes and place them on what was called the gamut, which is the standard musical staff. This allowed them to visualize the relationships between the notes that they had already sung with familiarity. Again, you can see his examples, Smith and Little's notation, directly under Tufts on the handout to get an idea for what that would look like in the original shape note tune books. But shape note singing schools were more than just a system of music education. This was also a social outlet a gathering of peoples. I'd like to spend a little time delving into what those gatherings looked like and what they sounded like. Shape note singing has been called the oldest colonial American choral tradition. Because it involves people learning how to read music and sing in a group rather than individually, there's always been a social aspect to the music making process. The singing schools were a time of socializing with friends, and they were one of the few times men and women, boys and girls, were instructed together rather than separately. As a result, singing tools took on a little bit of a flirtatious turn. <laughs> and then as with any good social event, food was central to the gathering. As we 
we've done tonight, people would bring dishes to share. They would sing for a bit, break for food, and then get back to the singing. Shape Note singing has always been about community and the idea that all are welcome in the hollow square, just as they are welcome at the table. The hollow square is the way singings are set up. This room has been set up in such a way to demonstrate that. You have four sides creating in the middle a hollow square. <laughs> Makes sense. You would have each voice part on each side of the square. So you might have your tenors where the melody is, lies. You would have the, the basses and the altos and the sopranos and they would all, they would have each of their own sections. That way they had the stability of hearing the people around them singing their part. But they also were able to hear one another into the square. The leader would stand in the center and kind of do a little bit of a 360 meeting and they would wave their arm in a way to keep beat uh, around with all of the square just kind of leading in. Oftentimes people would join in uh, and it was one of those, those situations where anyone could lead. Normally we come to choir to learn music that we perform in a concert hall, but that wasn't really the purpose of these types of gatherings. It was set up for communal enjoy enjoyment, not a performance. Any concept of performing was really just for one another. The sound of shape note singings became a very distinctive characteristic. The typical timbre of voice for this tradition is incredibly bright and forward with a nasal quality to it. The tone books themselves ask for full voice with no vibrato, just a piercing straight tone. And it is. <laughs> the performance of the hymns is done with robust energy pulsing strong beats, and all at a very loud dynamic level. The music of the hymns tend to break the traditional rules of European harmony. There are often parallel fifths and octaves and unisons. The harmonies of open fifths and parallel movement have often been compared to the music of the medieval times. Frequently, you'll find parallel fourths between outer voices and between upper voices. The dissonances that you hear often go unprepared and unresolved, and voice crossing between parts is relatively common. I'm going to lead a small group of singers in the singing of a shape note hymn called Wondrous Love. Uh, before they sing, I'd like you to just kind of be listening. You'll have on your handout that list of characteristics of shape note songs. You can follow along and see what you can hear, perhaps the distinct vocal timbre, parallel fifths, octaves, uh, unprepared dissonances, voice crossings. If that means nothing to you, just enjoy the hymn. <laughs> They'll first sing the hymn on fossil lost syllables, as the tradition would. When you would start a hymn, everyone would read it through on the syllables first. That way they didn't have to worry about learning the text right away. They could just learn the melodies and the harmonies using that syllable system in the same similar fashion to how people use solfege before they sing on text in, in choir rehearsals. I'll have my ensemble to come up and we'll, we'll show you a little bit of what that might have sounded like.
old tradition, and at least by American history standards it is. But my question is, where does this tradition stand now? I hope to answer that a little bit in this next section. Since the folk revival of the 1960s and 70s, shake note music rose in popularity, particularly in the Midwest, New England, and urban areas on both the East and West coasts. Originally, it was seen as a predominantly Southern tradition that took place in the South. After the 60s and 70s, it started to move to more urban areas. Suddenly, folk music was becoming popular during this time through the efforts of Joan Baez, Bob Dylan, and the like. Then, fast forward a couple of decades, we have in the early 2000s, shape note music getting its big Hollywood break with the film Cold Mountain in 2003. Two shape note tunes were featured in that film, being sung by shape note singers from around the country. The exposure brought shape note singing out from its rural happenings and into the public eye, or ear, as it were. It wasn't perfect representation of the tradition, but it did bring awareness to it. After their exposure, some news outlets claimed that the performance would save a dying tradition. But the majority of shape note community would disagree with that statement. They don't consider it to be a dying tradition, but one that is thriving amongst its few but proud participants. After researching this tradition and learning of the renaissance of interest in shape note music, I started to delve deeper to see if these tunes could be found in composers and arrangers of the late 20th century and early 21st century. My own perception was that suddenly there seemed to be more arrangements coming out, using these tunes as source material. This seemed logical considering the resurgence of the 60s and 70s, and then again in the early 2000s, after Cold Mountain. So what are composers doing with these tunes now? In her thesis, Reshaping American Music, the quotation of shape note hymns by 20th century composers, written in 2009, Musicologist Dr. Joanna Smoko delves into various instrumental, choral, and operatic forms over the, lap, over the 20th century that quote either in part or in whole shape note tunes. She traces it back from the 1930s through Cold Mountain in 2003. Clearly, these tunes lend themselves to many different types of composition, not just choral, but the instrumental compositions and operatic compositions as well. In her master's thesis, Sacred Harp in the Choral Setting, written in 2003, Teresa Baker discusses the practical applications of using shape note unison tunes and two to three part songbook arrangements in elementary and children's choirs. She goes on to note that more composers, as well as music educators, are turning to these tunes as source material for their arrangements because of their simplicity, singability, and versatility. Earlier this year, in October, I interviewed Dr. Dirk Johnson, a professor of the West Virginia State University, who has been researching shape note tunes as source material for his own arrangements. He indicated that his own anecdotal research into the subject indicates an uptick of interest in shape note tunes being used by composers more recently. He told me of his own experience with arranging shape note tunes, how he finds them to be a little quirky at times. But for a composer, melody is of prime importance and the shape note tune books are full of wonderful melodies. He admits that attempting to set a shape note tune in a manner that is in keeping with the tradition tends to be difficult and leave less scope for the imagination, but using the tunes to be able to express his own compositional style is incredibly effective. As a result of this resurgence of shape note interest, it appears composers of choral music have been looking back to these shape note tunes and using them as source material for their compositions. This is not a new practice. Composers for centuries have been taking pre-existing melodies and using them as the basis for their compositions. This might be acknowledged by Renaissance scholars as Cantus Firmus, seen in masses and motets. The parody and paraphrase masses during this time. Oftentimes composers would write a melody for one piece of music and then take that melody and use it as the basis for another uh, piece that they were working on, parodying their own material. The rest of this presentation will focus on an examination of six arrangements by composers of the last half of the 20th century through the present day that have used this old American tradition to shape their choral compositions. 
using a variety of compositional techniques. The shape note tunes have provided a common thread which each composer has used to weave his or her own tapestry of music, utilizing each individual's characteristic compositional practices, or the compositional characteristic practices of the time in which they were composed. As such, the pieces presented here will be in chronological order of when they were published. I'll discuss each piece and offer snippets of them for you to better hear certain compositional traits so that when the choir performs at the end, you should hopefully have a little bit greater understanding of what to listen for. It's worth noting that the purpose of these compositions is for performance, which differs from the intended function of shape note hymns. You can refer to your program for the list of pieces I'll be discussing, and keep the list of shape note singing characteristics handy, because I'll refer back to it several times. The first piece on our concert is called Wondrous Love. It's arranged by choral legend Alice Parker in 1960. <laughs> Miss Parker has a great number of shape note arrangements accredited to her. She even composed an opera and cantata based on this tradition. The name of this piece, which is Wondrous Love, is actually the name of the shape note tune from which it was based, the one the ensemble just, just sang for you previously. It might be useful to note that tunes often have one or two word names. Sometimes they were related to the text of the hymn, but oftentimes they were unrelated. This tune contains many of the shape note characteristics mentioned previously. Parallel fifths and octaves. You'll hear the melody often in the tenor. It ends on an open fifth. In the shape note tune books, the tune is often printed in the Aeolian mode, and the singers would raise the sixth scale degree spontaneously in the performance of it in the, in the shape note hollow. Here, Parker goes ahead and writes it in Dorian mode to account for the raised sixth. In her arrangement of this beloved tune, Parker utilizes the archaic traditions of both Old World and New World by combining elements of the shape note tradition from America, as well as certain medieval elements. Yet, their arrangement is quintessentially Alice Parker, whose iconic arrangements of folk tunes have now inspired and educated several generations of composers. Spoiler alert, there's one we're going to hear later that was inspired by one of the very <coughs> compositions. As the melody winds through the soprano and alto voices in short notes, she elongates the note values of the tune in the tenor, and then even further in the bass acting as a Kansas firmness for the harmonic progression. I'm going to have Choral Union sing an excerpt. We're going to start with just the soprano and altos singing the, the short note melody. Then I'll have you hear the tenors on longer notes, then the basses on even longer notes. And then we'll sing it together so that you can hear how she stacked it together.
program, The Road Home, Stephen Paulus arranges this particular piece to the tune of Prospect. He uses four voice choir with soprano solo. The tune Prospect is based on a pentatonic scale, not uncommon for shape no hymns. In his arrangement of this tune, Paulus <coughs> actually sets the tune Prospect to a modern secular text by Michael Dennis Brown. While the road home could certainly still be interpreted as a religious expression, it also allows for a much broader, broader interpretation for all humankind, regardless of religious affiliation. In a way, this is very much in keeping with the shape note singings that go on today. Though many view the singings as religious observance, they are open to anyone, regardless of religious affiliation. Paul's setting is a cappella. He keeps the tune intact in its pentatonic form, but instead of the melody being in the tenor, it's given to the sopranos, which is more common in choral arrangements, particularly nowadays. Paulus's harmonization of the tune uses a more modern idiom, utilizing non-chord tones in a more chord cluster style. Choral Union will sing the unadorned pentatonic melody first, and then they'll sing it with Paulus's distinct harmonization. examples 
have kept with the tradition of a cappella vocal singing. As a tradition that developed in southern rural areas, many of the churches would not have had the resources to perform accompanying music, so they would often learn to sing unaccompanied. <coughs> However, in Mark Hayes' arrangement of Hark I Hear the Harps Eternal, Hayes sets the four voices in a manner that at first seems pretty consistent with the traditional style. You'll hear open fifth sonorities in the harmony, though they don't usually move in parallel motion. In fact, it would hurt a cappella, one can actually hear that influence of Alice Parker that I spoke of earlier, because it sounds remarkably like her arrangement of the same tune. I'm going to have Choral Union sing the, the chorus of this piece a cappella, so you can get an idea for that characteristic sound. <laughs> Thank you. 
voice some key differences, however, in his shape note style arrangement. You'll hear some dynamic contrast in the piece to heighten the textual meaning. And as I mentioned before, both shape note singings are done at one volume, really loud. <laughs> the most notable difference in Houston's arrangement is the secular nature of the text. If looking for an accessible way to introduce this style of singing to public high school students, this might be a really great option. The most recent composition on our program tonight is Wayfaring Stranger, arranged by Michael Engelhart and published just in 2018. This piece takes the shape note to Wayfaring Stranger and fuses it with Latin chant of the medieval time period and dubstep, because those things go together. <laughs> He creates, by using all of these elements, he creates an adventurous new aesthetic. <clears throat> the composer wants the singers, particularly the soloist at the beginning, to sing in that bright, forward manner of the tradition. He opens with a tenor solo on the melody, a nod to the tradition of the melody being in the tenor. Houston also employs many instances of voice crossing between the parts. Interestingly, Engelhart weaves in the text, Libaros, which means deliver us in Latin. He uses this chant throughout the piece, hearkening back to those medieval connections again. He sheds the simple three-to-voice part structure of a typical hymn and uses instead full eight vocal part setting that is set in polyphony at most times. Engelhardt adds the dubstep element through the use of a bass line and percussion. There is an option uh, if, you're, if you want to download electronic tracks as well that will add even further to that, but tonight you'll hear the bass and the drum set. I'm not going to need to demonstrate that because you will not miss it in the performance. <laughs> After all the complexities that Engelhardt has added in his fusion arrangement, he ends on a simple open fifth, acknowledging the simplicity of the tomb's roots in a rather effective in conclusion, through these six pieces, we see that contemporary composers are still utilizing these old tunes hundreds of years later. They're being inspired by the style of singing carried on by this tradition. The simplicity of their melodic interest and harmonic structure have given composers material that can be used in a variety of ways, each piece showcasing the creativity and idiosyncratic compositional traits of contemporary composers. By doing so, the composers are giving new life to these tunes. Now, I don't mean new life because the shape note tradition is dying, which as we've already discussed, it is not. But it's more like an old tradition that begets a new generation that has left the comforts of home and searched for new adventures, but never forgetting its roots. Please enjoy the concert, and do join us for food and fellowship afterwards. Thank you.